Welcome to another episode of Marie's wonderful biology revision sessions. Okay, so today we're talking about gaseous exchange in insects. So I've made this little A3 sheet for you guys to have a nose at. So we have to learn about gaseous exchange in mammals, insects and fish as well. So this is a handy one for insects which often get overlooked but they are part of our specs so we need to know about them. So insects are animals like us but they belong to a different phylum of the arthropoda phylum. The arthropoda phylum in includes um, spiders as well and uh, all things like lobsters and crabs in the sea. Uh, and then one of the classes of the arthropoda is the insects, insecta class. So insects generally characterised by this body plan of having a head, a thorax and an abdomen and most of them can fly. Okay, I say most, not all of them. So insects have a small surface area and a large volume which gives them a small surface area to volume ratio which means they cannot rely on diffusion alone to get oxygen and carbon dioxide to all of their cells like a very small organism could, like an amoeba. Another thing we need to know about insects is that they have an open circulatory system. So the way they get their nutrients and ions around the body is a bit different from ours. They have a heart, a bit like us, but it's more like a long tubular heart. And the heart pumps haemolymph, which is a sort of similar to blood, Hemolymph around the body, but the tubes, instead of going back to the heart, they just sort of end. Here, look. They come from the heart and just end. And the hemolymph becomes part of the tissue fluid and very slowly makes its way around all the cells and the tissues and slowly makes its way back to the heart. So this is great for moving around uh, nutrients like glucose from your food but it's far too slow and inefficient to transport carbon dioxide and oxygen to the cells because it's just relying on diffusion alone. And as we said earlier, because they have a small surface area to volume ratio, we cannot rely on diffusion alone to get oxygen to our cells in an insect because by then the cells will have started to die. So the insect's solution is to have a separate respiratory system which is involved with basically loads of holes going to the inner parts of their body. So here's the body plan again, this is a locust. We've got the head and its antennae which it uses to sense its environment, the eyes there, and then this bit here is the thorax and the back part is the abdomen and locusts have these long wings extending backwards. Okay, so their respiratory system is made up of loads of holes on the outside called spiracles uh, tubes in between them called tracheae and smaller ones called tracheoles and there's lots of big air sacs interspaced uh, around the middle of the abdomen and thorax as well. So this ensures that oxygen is getting to all the cells in the body by literally cutting a hole to them. Okay, very simple solution but it's um, evolved over time to be quite sophisticated. Okay, so let's have a closer look. Here we go, we're having a closer look. Uh, so there you go, you can see the spiracle on the outside of the exoskeleton. Spiracles can open and close to allow oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. Uh, behind the spiracle are these long tubes called tracheae, which extend all around the body of the insect. And finally, these small, small tracheoles attach to the muscle cells. And that is where you get the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the tracheoles and the cells. So you are literally getting oxygen to the cells directly from the atmosphere and carbon dioxide uh, diffusing out. So totally relies on simple diffusion. Um, but apart from simple diffusion, insects can also sort of pump their abdomen like bellows to draw air in and out. I've got a video of that to show you here. Uh, here's a grasshopper pumping its abdomen. Can you see? It's very slightly moving its abdomen in and out, and this helps to uh, sort of squash and draw in air in and out of its abdomen to help with gaseous exchange. 
Uh, this is quite a limited system. It means that insects can't really get much bigger than 15 centimetres. Uh, because there's just too many cells then to support with this system. Can you imagine the extent of the tracheal system then? It would be quite impressive. Uh, also, their exoskeleton would probably get a bit too heavy for them and they'd need even more oxygen to move around to combat uh, the excess weight. Uh, back in the Carboniferous period, about 300 million years ago, the oxygen concentration was a lot higher and you did get these giant insects, you know, like dragonflies and meter long. But luckily, um, they are... Um, quite small now because oxygen levels have dropped right down again. Phew! Okay, another view now from the side. Some facts about spiracles. So spiracles are literally a hole, aren't they? They're a hole in the insect's body to the outside environment, which allows atmospheric air to get in from the outside, uh, here, from the exoskeleton, to the inside, to the cells. There you go, there's some cells in there. Now this does cause some problems, there can be a lot of water loss uh, because uh, insect cells are exposed to the outside environment. So um, they combat this in a few different ways, they can open and close their spiracles in an efficient manner to control water loss. Um, you get these little muscles around the spiracal edges that contract to close them and relax to open them back up. Okay. Also, um, because this seems like a bit of a strange way of making sure you've got oxygen, if for any reason there's a, um, um, the, you know, they can't get oxygen, like some spiders, they uh, sort of dive underwater to hunt for smaller insects. If they cannot get oxygen, for a small period of time and the spiracles are closed, they can store oxygen for a little while in these air sacs so they can still uh, continue to exchange gas efficiently. Uh, these tracheae are also full of hairs, which tries to prevent a bit of water loss. So the idea is that any water droplets coming in and out uh, should get trapped by the hairs and it stops too much water being lost from the body. Uh, oxygen diffuses in down a concentration gradient and carbon dioxide diffuses out. So this is a totally passive process, simple diffusion only. And you might have noticed there's some fluid at the end of each tracheal. And this provides a moist exchange surface um, for gaseous exchange to happen. Remember the lining of the alveoli in the lungs is kept moist by surfactants? Similar sort of process. We need a little bit of moisture to help speed up that uh, diffusion of gases. So what happens is the oxygen actually dissolves into the water first and then is um, diffused into uh, the other liquid areas of the body, like the cytoplasm of cells. And finally, this is quite interesting, during active movement this fluid is drawn up into the cells. So the cells are actively respiring, um, using up a lot of glucose and changing the osmotic water potential of the cells. It actually decreases, oh sorry, increases the osmotic water potential of the cells, which causes water to move by osmosis into the cells. So what happens is this, um, you know, where the edge of this water is, it actually moves closer to the cells. So the air can get closer to the cells as well. So it allows the atmospheric air to reach deeper into the tracheoles and nearer the cells so they have more access to oxygen when they're respiring at high rates. Okay, and that's the end of the video. There you go, there's a full view of the revision sheet in case you want to take a screenshot. Okay, and I'll be back soon.